Good morning. Welcome to the e-Sikshana program of the VTU uh, for the course of uh, transmission and distribution for fourth semester students. So this is Professor Umar Rao from RB College of Engineering, uh, bringing you the lectures under the e-Sikshana program. So today we are on to session two and we will see what we are going to do in today's class. So in the first class, I uh, introduced you to the concepts of, uh, you know, AC transmission, DC transmission, and uh, we discussed a brief history of uh, how AC became more popular after Tesla uh, popularized and uh, invented uh, induction motors and uh, we just saw the evolution of the transmission system. So in today's class, uh, we will see what are the advantages of high voltage transmission and uh, how do we classify high voltage, extra high voltage that is EHV and UHV ultra high voltage and what are the advantages and disadvantages of HVDC. So we saw that the first transmission system installed was DC by Edison, but it was of a very low voltage, right? So now we have HVDC and I told you because of the mature maturing converter technology today, we can have converters of very high voltages and that's why HVDC systems are becoming popular. And we will also see how interconnections are made in the transmission system using feeders, distributors, and service mains. So this is our objective for this session. Firstly, why do I need to transmit at high voltages? So what are the advantages? So there are a lot of advantages, but the prime one, which is the main attraction, is the one which gives you all the other advantages. So all the other advantages revolve around this. Now we will see what, what it is. So if you take single phase, the AC real power, active power P is given by VI cos phi. So you can see I is equal to, from this I can write P by V cos phi, right? So if I have a low power, power factor cos phi is low, then what will happen? I will increase. Or if I have a low voltage also, I will increase. I'm assuming for the same power. So when you keep the active power a constant, the power factor that is cos phi and the voltage level both affect the current drawn. Now power factor is not under my control because that depends on the load, right? And uh, there are restrictions on the power factor so you cannot control it beyond a certain limit. You don't have actually, the utility does not have control on that. But the voltage I want to transmit is under my control. So as I use higher voltages for transmission, the current flowing through the transmission lines will reduce to evacuate the same active power P. Clear? So the first important thing about using higher voltages is that the current in the conductor, here we, we are talking of the transmission line, will be lower, even on the distribution side. But distribution side, what happens? I'm actually going to give it to the consumer. So I, I have to have the voltage levels which is suitable for the consumer. But transmission is where I'm evacuating the power from the generator to the distribution. So I can use whatever voltage I want because nobody is going to tap power at that voltage, right? So increasing the voltage reduces the current flow through the conductors for the same amount of power. This is the most important impact and the most important effect of operating at higher voltages. Because of this, what will happen? Since the current is reduced, the size of the conductor will also reduce, obviously, because the conductor is expected to take the same uh, power. So the size of the conductor will reduce because the current reduces. This means that the volume will reduce and the cost of the 
conductor will also reduce. Next, if the current reduces, automatically the losses also will reduce in the conductor because the loss is equal to I squared R. And the loss will reduce not linearly as squared. So it's proportional to I squared. So if I reduce loss by, uh, if I, sorry, if I reduce current by 20%, the loss reduction will be much more than 20%. It'll be square of that. 40% it will reduce. Okay. And then if the losses reduces, automatically efficiency will be greater. So you will be operating the system at higher efficiencies. And if the current reduces, the voltage drop also will reduce. Voltage drop is in the line. If you have a transmission line or any conductor, mm -hmm. the voltage drop in the conductor is equal to I into Z, right? So if I reduces, the IZ drop also reduces, which means that the difference in the voltage between sending end and receiving end will reduce. So the voltage regulation defined as Vs, the sending end voltage minus Vr, the receiving end voltage divided by Vs. So this regulation you would have seen, you would have seen the definition of regulation in transformers, etc. So there you would have used full load voltage, no load voltage, etc. Now here we will use sending end and receiving end. So the sending end voltage minus receiving end voltage. So why is there a difference? The difference is because of the drop in the line, the drop in the line as a percentage of sending end voltage. So the regulation also will improve and the installation cost will improve. It will be less. Okay. And if you are using higher voltages, then the number of circuits can be reduced because the conductor, uh, the current is reduced. And if you reduce the number of uh, circuits, that is the parallel circuits you have to use. See, if I want to draw a current X, okay, if I want to have, have a current flow of X from one end to other end, I can have two circuits each taking X by two, right? Instead of having one circuit with X. So as the power increases, we have parallel circuits so that we can use some standard conductors. So now when the current itself reduces, the number of circuits will reduce. And therefore, to run these transmission lines across land, you have to pay them. I can't simply wildly run transmission lines, right? Or may, I may even have to acquire the land. That's called as right of way cost. Right of way means I am going to use your land for my uh, whatever, for my uh, own uh, uh, interest. And so I want to pay you for right of way for using your land. So I won't, I won't do anything on the land. I will be running the line above the land. I'll be running the transmission line above the land, but there is a cost involved. So this land cost also will reduce. So now you see why I told you everything revolves around reduction of current. That's the prime thing. So because current reduces, losses reduce. And because losses reduce, uh, you know, efficiency improves. And the voltage drop reduces because the current drops. This gives to rise to improved regulation. And since the current reduces, the conductor size cost reduces. So everything boils down to current. Therefore, the biggest advantage of transmitting at higher voltages is that you can transmit the same power with lesser current. Clear? And that's the reason why world over high voltages are used for transmission. So some standard voltages are, I told you, these voltages will vary from country to country. So in India, we have 220 kV, 400 kV, and 765 uh, kV. So systems that operate between 400 and uh, 765 are called as EHV. That means extra high voltage AC. And above 765, they're called as ultra high voltage. Names, that's all. Okay. And we have HVDC systems that operate at 800 kV DC. And uh, we have a project where you are going to have up to 1000 kV HVDC transmission line. So we will see more of these uh, different uh, levels now. 
So what are the advantages of EHVAC? I told you EHV is voltages between 400 to 765, so really high. The advantages are same as we saw for high voltage in general. More reduction in current losses, reduction in con conductor volume, increase in transformer efficiency, reduced line cost, increase in line capacity, feasibility of adding parallel lines. You can add more parallel lines and significant reduction in cost per kilowatt of transmission. Because the, conduct every, the conductor cost comes down, efficiency improves, land cost comes down, installation cost comes down. So in power, we calculate it as what is the cost per kilowatt of power to be transmitted, that it will itself will come down. This is one of the, I mean, you have so many advantages of um, extra high voltages being used. However, it doesn't come without um, payback. I do have some disadvantages. The first is Corona will increase. Corona is actually, I don't know if any of you have seen, uh, while you travel by trains in the night. So around the transmission lines, you might see a blue color light. So that's the breakdown of air around the conductor. That's called as Corona. Okay, the air breaks down. So it causes some loss. Okay, so Corona will increase with increase in the voltages and you will have radio interference, interference with communication um, and lines and you have a difficulty in erection, right? And uh, one thing is your conductor cost may come down, conductor cost may come down with uh, increase in the voltage, but associated equipment cost will go up because when the voltages are high, the transformer must be of the suitable rating. So your transformer cost, switch gear, the whatever you use, you know, the circuit breakers and other switches you use, other protection equipment you use, their ratings will increase. So that cost will go up. And the electrostatic field around a very high voltage is not good for humans and animals. It's not good for humans and animals. So around a vicinity, you will not find people, you cannot have houses, etc. around some vicinity. There are, there are standards for that. And then insulation. I have to insulate the, whatever my towers, etc. for that high voltage. So insulation cost also will go up. So high voltages are not without their disadvantages. Both are there. So we have a trade-off. Why I'm telling you is you can't say, okay, I can go high. Why not I go up to 3000 kV or 5000 kV? No, you can't. There is a restriction. Clear. So now, how are we able to go to higher voltages today? Because material technology has improved. So we have very good insulators. We will see in the next sessions about insulating materials. So we have very good insulators and uh, smaller size, lighter weight. So we are able to insulate equipment to higher voltages. And that's how we are able to proceed now. But I can't just go on increasing it. I can't go on increasing it. Okay. Next, uh, UHV transmission lines are good when you have real bulk power. Okay, a lot of power. And, uh, uh, you know, the critical issue for uh, UHV has been right of way because the electrostatic field effect is pretty high. And you may want to run the lines through forests. So in which case the animals in the forests are affected. So this has been one of the major uh, uh, challenges in uh, implementing uh, UHV transmission, okay? So UHV is above 765 kV for AC and above 800 kV for DC. So they have been built in China, etc. Uh, India is all set now to deploy a 1200 kV power transmission line on a uh, commercial uh, basis and boosting our country's prospect is the successful implementation of a 1200 kV test station at Bina in Madhya Pradesh under PPP. PPP stands for Public Private Partnership. So as engineers, you should know the world is, India especially, we are moving to PPP. That means the government, public is the government, they invest, private people, private parties, companies, investors, they also invest and they form a partnership. So this model has become very popular in uh, power and then transport and bridges, tolls, highways, etc. They all are called as PPPs. So under the PPP initiative, 
uh, we have successfully tested a 1200 kV um, station at Bina in Madhya Pradesh and the initiative uh, goes to uh, Power Grid Corporation of India. It's called as PGCIL, Power Grid Corporation of India Limited. So some of the advantages of UHVAC are in large countries. See, we have Europe is made of smaller countries, Germany, France, uh, etc. So, um, you know, whenever people ask me, oh, in India, you have so many languages. Uh, I say, yeah, India is like Europe. Okay, in Europe, you have so many languages. You have, you have German, you have French, you have Spanish, you have Italian, etc. Only thing is India has all these countries and they're all states. That's why we have so many languages. So India is a huge country. China is a very large country. So in such countries where the, geographically the country is very big, then your source may be very far away. The source of power generation may be very far away from the load centers, may be very far away from the load centers. And therefore, evacuating power is cheaper when you go for ultra high voltages. So that's why, uh, you know, yeah, China, India, are planning to go for very high voltages, ultra high voltages. And it's possible to build uh, the generation plants far away from the load centers, okay? So let us say now you want to have a huge solar farm, but the location for solar PV generation is good at some far off place, which is not very developed economically. Okay, how are you going to evacuate power then? I'll generate there. And so it is, you know, in such cases where your sources are far away and where you can utilize sources uh, and you want to evacuate power from there, we go for um, ultra high uh, voltage AC systems. For example, wind, you cannot set up a wind farm wherever you want. You can set up a wind farm where the wind velocity is good enough for generation of power using wind, isn't it? So that will be some far off place. So, so in such cases, and if your country is really big, then UHV is good. It's a very good option. So what are the drawbacks of UHV? We saw some advantages. One is for UHV lines, they transfer huge amounts of bulk power and uh, connectivity is very intense, right? So uh, if you lose that, uh, you know, so I won't use UHV for low, low powers. I will only use it when the power is really high. So if anything happens to the line, you lose bulk power. You lose a lot of power and there are chances of blackout. So it reduces the power system security and reliability. Isn't it? Yeah, because if anything happens uh, to the line, the entire power is lost. So the, the crux here is UHV lines are expensive. A lot of issues are, and challenges are there. And so I use it only when I want to transfer bulk power, lot of lot, large amount of power. So in, in such a case, I become vulnerable. It's like if there is only one flight, okay? If there is only one flight transporting people from one place to another place, huge flight. If that flight goes, nobody can travel. So instead of that, I'll have, if I have some three smaller flights, it's okay. Even if one flight is canceled, the other two flights will carry the people. This is the analogy I'm trying to give to make you understand. So here, if the UHV line goes, there are very high chances of a blackout. That's the first effect. And environmental issues, we are still not very clear about, you know, the effect of all these electrostatic and electromagnetic fields on, on uh, living uh, things not only human beings and animals, also plants. And now they're observing, for example, uh, even with solar and wind power, uh, after, you know, after some years of installation, they find that wherever solar panels are uh, installed in large areas, around that areas, there are no birds, etc. Maybe because of the heat of the glass, or maybe that, you know, when the sun falls, there is a glare which they uh, cannot uh, withstand, whatever. Similarly, the wind turbines, you know, they give you a low humming sound. And people have found that this humming sound can drive your uh, uh, mind insane. So they, have, they, they, they say that within some radius, houses 
uh, should not be there and they don't find any animals near wind farms so these are all experiences you know people are coming to research as as the installations evolve so when i when i install a uhv line i don't know what is its effect i can't tell immediately after 10 years if i observe and see what are the changes then i can make out so a lot of environmental issues are there and uh, economic issue because the lines are very expensive expensive so people feel you know the utilities feel that uh, instead of having a uhv line to transport bulk power from one uh, end to the other end we can as well have chps that is combined heat and power generations locally so try to generate the power locally this is one uh, aspect because ehv lines are very expensive clear uh, now coming to hvdc so as it stands today our dc generation source is only solar pv solar solar generates um, dc voltage okay whereas all our alternators in conventional plants like hydel plant thermal plants nuclear plants gas based plants diesel plants and wind wind farms all these produce ac all these produce ac so in hvdc what is done at the sending end i take the ac and convert it to dc that means i rectify it clear and then i transmit dc then i transmit dc and at the receiving end i have dc i will invert it make it into ac and then give it to the loads and then give it to the loads clear so that is it's called as hvdc transmission i am not using hvdc my loads all need ac so i convert it at both ends so ac to dc transmit dc dc to ac and then give it to the load so the first commercial hvdc transmission system was built very early in 1954 uh, between uh, sweden sweden and uh, then there is an island called called uh, gotland about 96 kilometers offshore so from the island between the island and the mainland they had had a hvdc link so in india we first commissioned the hvdc link in 1990 between rihan and dadri near delhi and this is a 814 km uh, bipolar line with a transmission voltage of 500 uh, kv and a power transfer of 1500 megawatts okay coming to karnataka itself the first hvdc line was commissioned in 2003 between talchur and kolar and the voltage was plus or minus 500 kv and the capacity was 2000 megawatts and it's a long line 14 50 kilometers yesterday i told you that hvdc is economical over ac if the transfer is over 600 kilometers so you have hvdc has their own costs we'll see in the next slide what it is so the stalchar kolar line is 1450 uh, kilometers and it has a capacity of power transfer of 2500 megawatts a uh, very high capacity plus or minus 800 kv 6000 megawatt hvdc bipolar line bipolar means plus minus 800 and 800 is it being implemented um in assam from assam to agra okay there's a place uh, called bishwanath uh, sharyali in assam and from there to agra in uttar pradesh uh, through west bengal a uh, very high capacity dc line is being planned in india so why do we go to this purpose of uh, uh, hvdc the first one is connection of two asynchronous ac grids this today is not a major issue anyway let us see what it is so what are asynchronous grids so if you take india i have five regional grids that is the northern grid the northeast grid eastern grid southern grid and the western grid okay so if i want to transfer power from one area to another area i must synchronize isn't it i must synchronize so you all have studied in machines that for synchronization of two ac sources their voltage the frequency and the phase sequence must match clear i repeat the voltage magnitude the frequency and the phase sequence must match 
So now let us say I have one grid, say the Eastern grid. Okay. They are operating at a frequency of 50.2 or something. India, I told you in the first session itself, our standard frequency is 50 hertz. Supposing the generation is high, the frequency will be slightly higher. So I, you know, this there is a perfect control in the system to maintain the frequency at 50 hertz, but it won't be a flat line. It won't be a flat line. It will be slightly varying. So whenever the generation is more, the frequency will be more than the nominal. So let us just assume that the Eastern grid is operating at 50.2 uh, hertz. Okay. And we want to send power to the Southern grid. And our Southern grid is operating at 49. Uh, say 5 hertz because the demand is very heavy. That's why I want to borrow from the East. So I have two grids, one operating at 50.2 and the other operating at 49.5. I can't synchronize these two because the frequencies are very different. Clear? So what we have is we have what is called as a back-to-back -back link. So there is a back-to-back -back link in a place called Gajuaka uh, near Vishakapatnam. So this was a link between the eastern grid, eastern regional grid and the southern grid. So what this back-to-back -back link do is there is no transmission as such. So in the station, in the DC uh, substation, I take the AC power at 50.2 Hertz, convert it to DC, right? And then invert it back to the frequency of the receiving grid, which I told you could be 49.5, clear? So since I cannot synchronize 49.5 AC voltage with an AC voltage of 50.2 Hertz, what I do, I take this 50.2 Hertz, convert it to DC and then invert it back to 49.5. These are called as asynchronous grids. Okay. So these stations like this, where there is no transmission, but there's just a conversion. These are called as back-to-back -back links, back-to-back -back links. That means they will be at one place only. Otherwise, your rectifier will be at one end and the receiver, the inverter will be at the receiving end. That, that we saw could be anything between 700 and we saw it is in one case it's 1450 kilometers away here both are in the same location it's called as back to back and uh, i told you we have one in gajuaka and uh, there is one in chandraput uh, so hvdc is very useful for such cases the second advantage is when you have long distance water crossings that means you have to have over a river or a sea in AC lines, the length of the cable, I won't have it overhead, no, on water, it will be underground. The length of the cable is limited because of the reactive power. You will study in unit four, what, what is the problem with the underground cables? So I told you cable is a conductor with an insulation over it. So in such cases, HVDC is used, clear. So where you want to transport power through a water body. Controllability. So we can control the active power because by you control of the converters. And you can reduce the profile of wiring because HVDC can carry more power per, per conductor of a given size because the inductance does not affect. I told you the drop is very less. The inductor offers zero impedance to DC because frequency is zero. And you know the reactance is L omega. Omega is zero for HVDC, for DC itself. So the reactance drop is not there. So this will reduce the wiring and pylons, et cetera. And uh, we can have a monopole. That means you can use the ground conductor, ground itself as a conductor. There are uh, uh, stations like that. And you don't have reactive power loss. You don't have the problem of skin effect. So what is the skin effect? I think you would have studied in machines. So skin effect means because of higher frequency, or you would have studied in field theory, when the frequency is high, the current does not penetrate deep into the conductor. So the current will be confined to the surface of the conductor. So the area, effective area reduces. So when the effective area reduces, R is equal to rho L by A, right? The effective resistance will increase and it will cause increased losses, skin effect. So that problem you don't have with DC because there is no frequency at all. That's a problem purely of frequency. Ferranti effect, 
Ferranti effect is, again, you will deal with Ferranti effect in detail later. Ferranti effect is where the receiving end voltage becomes more than the sending end voltage because of the line capacitance. So it's not there. Capacitors are open for DC. So that effect will not be there in, uh, when I use DC. I don't have a problem of stability. That means in, in, in stability, when you have many generators, AC generators, you have to synchronize all of them. So the frequency should be the same. So all the generators must be in synchronism. And this problem you don't have with DC. The corona is found to reduce. Radio interference is also reduced. So you see with all these, and you can have fewer conductors. AC, you will need three, three phase. So with DC, you can have lesser conductors. So there are many, many advantages of HV DC transmission. Clear? Of course, then I will all, everybody will use HV DC. Why I don't use when there are so many advantages? So obviously there are some disadvantages. Let us look what they are. Converters. I need converters that can handle a lot of power. You saw 1,500 megawatts, 2,000 megawatts. I need a rectifier and I need an inverter. And these are very, very expensive. And this expense does not offset, does not offset the other advantages of DC until or unless the length is more than 600 kilometers. Therefore, when the length is less than 600 kilometers, we don't go for DC. Then multi-terminal systems are complex. I have to control these converters. Now, see, any electronic device is a problem of control. You have to send the firing pulses to the converters. So control is a problem with multi-terminal uh, uh, devices. And all these converters, they generate harmonics. So they will cause more heat. I have to put a filter. So it will add to the cost. Okay. And uh, maybe this uh, harmonics may cause more of radio uh, interference. Though the DC per se doesn't cause, but the converters may cause radio interference. So these are some of the disadvantages. And as I, as I told you, everything has its own advantage and disadvantage. It's a trade-off. So when, when do the disadvantages, uh, you know, overshadow the advantages? When do the advantages offset the disadvantages? So we have to take a decision whether to implement or not. So grounding is also a, a problem. And um, if you use the ground as a conductor, it can cause corrosion of water pipes, et cetera, nearby. So these are some of the um, disadvantages and advantages of HVDC. Next, so we saw all, all the voltage levels, et cetera. Next, let us see some main components of a distribution system. So, distrib so we saw the transmission voltages, but distribution, I can't do anything. I have to do it at the voltage which the customer wants. So I told you in the first class, Industries, they, they evacuate power at 66 kV, 33 kV, and all domestic and all in India will be around 415 volts or 230 volts single phase. So I have to maintain those voltage levels. I can't do anything, anything there. So the main components of the distribution system are the distribution substations and the primary feeders. Feeders are lines. Feeders are lines. And uh, distributors are also lines. And then the distribution transformer and the service mains. So we will very briefly see uh, some aspects of this. So the distribution transform, uh, distribution substation will have step down trans uh, transmission voltages. I need to step down the transmission voltage. We saw I may have ultra high, extra high, all those voltages, right? So I have to step it down. So the first I will step it down to around 132 kV. And then yesterday we saw, in the previous session, 66 kV, 11 kV, 3.3, 6.6, 2.2. There are so many levels depending on what are the requirements of the load connected to that particular substation. So distribution substations typically operate at lower voltage levels and deliver power directly to the customer, either the industry or residential customer. So you just see the figure here. You have a sub-transmission uh, voltage, maybe 220 kV. And then the distribution substation will step it down and you have a feeder, distribution feeder. Then the, from the feeder, you can tap and then I can give it to customers. 
and I can have intermediate transformers at different levels, right? So this feeder, maybe this is uh, 66 kV. So one transformer uh, could be, you know, stepping down to the customer at 33 kV. Another customer may want uh, at 11 kV and so on. So you can do that. So this is how a distribution transform uh, substation is um, designed. Then we have feeders. So what is a feeder? So a feeder is a conductor. It's a line. It's a line. You will see, you know, when you go around, you will see from the pole to your house, etc. So a feeder is a conductor which connects the distribution substation to the area where the power is to be distributed. So I have the substation. I bring, bring a feeder to a particular area. For example, I will bring it to Kengeri. I, I will take it to RR Nagar. So some area. So the thing is in a feeder, I do not tap in between. I just... It, it's a conductor which will transmit power from the substation to one area. Okay. Intermediate, I won't tap it normally. So normally tappings are not taken from the feeder. So the current throughout will remain the same. Whereas if I take a tapping, what happens? Let us say I have, I, I, I have 100 amperes from the substation. I tap 10 amperes in between for some load. So next, after that, I have already diverted 10 amps. So if I satisfy KCL, next the outgoing current at the node will be 90 amps. So the con entire conductor will not have the same current. But if I don't have tappings, the current will be the same. So generally, when you talk of a feeder, you mean a, a conductor whose current is the same from the sending end to the receiving end. So here is the key factor in the design is the current carrying capacity, what we call as ampacity. Amp is a unit for current, ampere. So it's called as the ampacity. So you can say the feeder is the primary distribution line. Okay. So a distributor is a line from where I take tappings. You see here? So I, I, I take tappings. So this is a distributor. Clear? So the current will not be the same because I'm tapping in between. I'm tapping in between. So the size of the distributor should be such that the voltage at the consumer's end is within the permissible limits. If I take a very long distributor line, what will happen? The voltage keeps dropping in the line. So the end consumer may not have the required voltage. The voltage there may be low. So depending on the load at end and how we take tapping, we should see that all the consumers get the voltage at the correct level, permissible level. So there are different ways of de designing the distributors. We'll just very briefly see what it is. You have a radial distributor. Radial always means single line. Very simple and cheap. So you see, I have, I have a bus here. Then I have a breaker. I have a line. This line, straight line, one line, radial line. So in between, I tap to individual loads. In, in between, I tap to individual loads. The problem with this is, if there is a fault in the line, all, all of them will be cut off. All of them will be cut off. Clear? Next. Parallel distributor. Parallel distributor. So here what I have, I have two parallel lines, two parallel lines, and then I have a switch here. Right. So normally I will keep this switch open. I will keep this switch open. Right. So you see here, let us take the left hand side uh, line. So through the circuit breaker and transformer, this transformer will step down to the required voltage of the consumer. So it could be from 66 to 22 or 11 or 6.6, .6, whatever is the requirement of the load connected there. So from the left side, you see, I am going to supply to large industrial customers to I have shown. Then, and from the right side, I, you know, supply to some other people. So you just see here, uh, this large industrial customer I have shown, I have a connection from the left feeder. And I also have a connection from the right feeder. In between, there is a switch. Clear? Now, when this switch, let us say, I, there is a fault in one of the feeders. There's a fault in one of the feeders. Then what happens? There is always a path through the other feeder. 
Are you getting it? Because I have two in parallel. It is just like this. You think you are traveling and there are two, if there is only one route from, from your uh, source to your destination. If that route, then let us say there is a flood and that route is uh, not available, then you can't go. But if there is one more alternative parallel road, you can take that route. So it will improve reliability. It will improve reliability. Of course, costly because I have to put a parallel line. I have to put a parallel line. So it is more expensive. So, but it will improve reliability. Please remember there is no free lunch in life. You want something better, you have to pay for it. So this is the concept of a parallel feeder. Then you can have a ring main uh, feeder. Okay, so a distributor is arranged to form a closed loop and fed at more than one, uh, more, one or more points. We call it as a ring distributor. So you get the supply from more than one substation. Such a distributor starts from one point and makes a loop to the area to be served and returns to the main point. So you see, if I start from A, A, D, C, B. So there is a complete loop. There is a complete loop. The advantage is that, uh, you know, you can always feed, you can always feed all the loads, even if there is a fault in one part of the loop, there will be alternative paths. So a ring may fed from more than one substation is called as a meshed system. It is also a meshed system, but it is fed, if it is fed from more than one phase, one, one substation, it is called as a meshed system. So ring main and meshed both imply the same. So they go, go in a loop. They go in a loop. For example, here in this figure, you see, if a fault occurs at F, I isolate the line CD. I isolate the line CD, but I can meet all the loads because I have path. Alternative path is available. So these are the different types. So you see, this is one more uh, way you can have a meshed system. So let us say there is a fault in one of the lines. You can always feed from the other path. Clear? So all this costs money. We say we are building redundancy. Redundancy means what? Extra. We all human beings like everything to be redundant because we don't like any kind of discomfort. I don't like any kind of discomfort. Okay. So it is, we build redundancy with all this. So redundancy means if there is a fault, you have an alternate solution. It, it is expensive, but it improves reliability. The last is the service main. The service main is the cable connected between the distributor and the consumer terminal. So from your pole, you get to your house. Now that is called as the service main. Clear? So I have, this is my, sub, look at this figure. I have substation and uh, I have feeders. So SA and SC are feeders. And uh, I have, uh, from there, I have distributors. See, if in the feeder, SC or SA doesn't have tapping. Then I have distributors, then I have distributors. So in the distributors, there are tappings. And finally, I have the service main, which connects to the consumer. So then we have interconnectors. So in interconnectors, what happens is in a ring main, sometimes we have a connection in between. It is just used to supply a large area, that is a ring system. And hence, voltage drop across the variation, various sections may become large because you are forming a loop. No? So in a loop, you may have large voltage drops. So to compensate for this, sometimes you may join some parts of the ring through another conductor. Clear? So you see here, I have shown a, um, a conductor between node G and node D. So I just draw a, a, draw a conductor. So I'll have a shorter path between, between G and D. Otherwise, the power to D would be from G to A to B to C to D or G to F to E to D. So I'll have longer paths to, sh show, to shorten the paths. We have a conductor connected between two nodes. These are called as interconnectors. So in this session, we saw the advantages of um, uh, high voltage systems. We also saw disadvantages and we saw advantages of HVDC and uh, we saw the difference between a feeder or distributor and a service main. 
and a feeder you have the same current flowing through it you normally don't take any tappings in the feeder and in a distributor you'll have tappings in between and uh, at the end the service main will bring you the supply from the utility to your door step so thank you all uh, we'll stop here and uh, uh, continue